My name is Ramona Masachi. I'm an artist, a creator. I learned about modern monetary theory through Bernie Sanders' campaign. I wanted to understand his economic platform, which led me to his economic advisor, Stephanie Kelton. I started reading her work and it intrinsically resonated with me. So I wanted everyone else to learn about it. I got together with my friends at Real Progressives and we put together this book club. For nine weeks, we read and discussed Stephanie Kelton's bestseller, The Deficit Myth. We started each session with passages from that week's chapter. Then a guest took questions from the attendees. You're about to watch the recording of the Q&A section. This week, we covered Chapter 5, Winning at Trade. Our guest, John T. Harvey, has been a professor of economics at the Texas Christian University since 1987. He specializes in exchange rates macroeconomics, business cycles, and contemporary economic school of thought. Check out the Cowboy Economist on YouTube. On Twitter, he's at John underscore T underscore Harvey. Thank you. And I don't know if you saw my chat there. Suddenly the dog wants to play. So you may see me ducking down and grabbing dog toys every now and then and, and throwing them to keep him quiet. But thank you very much. Like this. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, so we will begin by um, asking, having our audience ask you questions. And Ganesh has a question. Ganesh well, is actually- May I give a, a little preliminary? Please um, do. So I saw some uh, questions regarding like, you know, what is the MMT view of so-and-so? And, and uh, I don't know what it is <laughs> because uh, a funny thing happened years, some years ago, I was on Facebook and I think it was Charles Hayden who said to me, how long have you been into MMT? And I was like, well, what's MMT? I didn't even know what it was. Um, and you might wonder, well, then I bet this, this guy doesn't know Randy Ray or Stephanie Kelton. Oh my God, Randy and I got our PhDs about the same time. We've known each other. All, and, and Stephanie I've known for, for just about when she got her PhD. Pavlina I knew before she got her PhD. I just didn't know they were calling it something else. All right, so, and, and when I did a, a thing with um, Christian and Patricia, uh, they named it what what I was calling it. This is just macroeconomics done properly. So I, I can tell you my view, but I'm not sure what the MMT view is, but I assume what I'm going to say is pretty much the same thing. We'll, we'll find out. And so so I, I do not present myself as a representative of MMT, although I am on the back of this exciting book right here. So <laughs> apparently I, I, I am something of a believer. So well, with, I with that, sorry. Well, we, we, we want to gain your, your knowledge and your perspective. So that's perfect. So Ganesh has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself, Ganesh? I okay, shall. I guess he's not here. I'm going to ask for him. Are we saying that since the U.S. dollar is the international currency, the U.S. must supply enough dollars to the rest of the world to keep international trade in real goods moving along? Is the trade deficit the only way to provide that? Aren't currency swap lines a tool to achieve the same result? Yes. <laughs> Gosh, I hope all the questions are this easy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I guess there, there's, there's more context to it than that. But yes, I mean, as a matter of fact, um, one of the things I talk about, I teach a class on exchange rates. And, uh, oh, and here's the dog, by the way. Uh, and one of the things I talk about to Sorry. my students is that, isn't it interesting that the dollar actually appreciated uh, over part of the financial crisis. And the reason was that there was a worldwide dollar shortage. Even though the, the crisis had started in the U.S., there was a worldwide dollar shortage. So all the U.S., because all the U.S. companies were bringing their liquidity back home. And yes, the, 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 the Fed then set up SWAT, or the, actually they set up um, agreements with uh, central banks around the world. But of course, I don't know that that would be a long-term solution. Um, but yes, that certainly is another option. But, but as I say, I think that, that Stephanie is getting into a lot of other issues as well in, in the chapter. Okay. Oh, uh, his name is Koble, C-O-B-L-E, which is my wife's grandmother's maiden name. Uh, I, I don't know why we came up with that, but we did. It's a beautiful name. Um, Aliyah has a question. Aliyah, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi. Um, 
So I have a question about the U.S. jobs guarantee. And if we have a jobs guarantee here, then what's to prevent companies from moving overseas and taking advantage of that cheap labor, knowing that people here will have a job and consumers will have money and there won't be sort of like public resentment? Right. Yeah, and I believe I may have seen your question in the Q and A because I, I and I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, I wanted to answer that one. Um, hey, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that that Stephanie is saying in there and that's been post Keynesian and I assume MMT line for a long time is that in our trade agreements we we have to start saying as she mentions in there, yeah, we're going to trade with you, but if you're trading by having people work over in gasoline suits over the top of fires. We're not going to trade with you, all right? Or, or we're going to we're going to add on a um, a tariff or whatever. If they're not following similar or or humane regulations as far as we're concerned, then uh, we're not going to trade with you. Uh, or rather, we're going to put a, a tariff of some sort on. So you know, I think part of the deal has to be that if we're losing jobs, then it can't be because they have ten year olds making something, you know, making Nikes in Indonesia or something like that. So we again, that's a kind of, kind of what I was saying to Ganesh's question that that there's a number of elements that are all coming together here that that uh, when you when you pull them out one by one, uh, then the answer wouldn't be the same as it as when you put it all together. And so uh, again, in, in one sense, nothing. You're right. Nothing would stop that unless we also say at the same time we're not entering in. And and, and you know I, I didn't tune back in uh, to the broadcast until the very end. Um, but I know when she was getting into the trade agreement stuff, oh my God, it's just maddening the the uh, way that they set it up to where individual companies can sue a sovereign government for passing a law that affects their profits and then settle it outside in a separate court. We can't allow that. Uh, and so, you know, if we have the job guarantee, it, it must come along with, with other, you know, um, I guess, uh, considerations as well. I don't know if that helps or not, but. That helps a lot. And, and by the way, I can talk for hours because I'm a college professor. So I am trying to stop myself rather than continue on a tangent. So um, someone else can ask a question. We like the talking for hours. Mm -hmm. The more you talk, the more we learn. The, 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 <laughs> so you say right now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> um, Raul has a question. Uh, good evening, John and Ramona. Um, is it easier for larger nations, I just put U.S. and China as examples, or entities like the EU to justify a trade deficit than smaller nations when viewed with an MMT or a macroeconomic lens? Yes. Um, yeah, I, here, here's and actually, uh, Stephanie touches on this at the end of the chapter again. If I'm um, Colombia, then I need foreign currency. All right, so I, I cannot sustain a trade deficit because, or I should know what the Colombian currency is, but I don't. Um, but uh, whatever currency they have is not going to be as easily uh, traded as the dollar or as the euro, as you mentioned. So it, it is, in, in fact, at this point, and she was arguing that we need to change the way the system works so that it wouldn't be as true anymore. But absolutely, right now, there is an international hierarchy of currencies. The dollar's at the top, then the euro, and, and on down to you know small developing nations who unfortunately desperately need imports uh, that, that, that can't, for things they can't make themselves. So yes, it is much more difficult uh, for somebody on the lower end of, of that um, hierarchy, which is something we talk about in, in, in my um, uh, exchange rate class. Uh, and we have a lot of people at Texas Christian, which by the way, the middle part uh, of Texas Christian University, everyone has to take one religion class, but it can be Buddhism. When my daughter went to TCU, she took Rastafarianism, uh, which is still Christianity, but but that that was her religion. But that's the only leftover from it being founded as, as a Christian college. Um, but we had we get a lot of Latin American students, and so they really pay attention when we talk about that. So, but you're right, it is a problem right now, absolutely. Um, is it possible? I have a question. Is it possible for a country, a large country like America, that has so many resources, to be able to produce most of the, the things that they need in the economy within the country? 
Yes. And, and, and I, I haven't looked at this. Um, that's one of the wonderful things about my job is that I can just do what I want to do. Uh, so, you know, I only did exchange rates for like a quarter of a century. I, I've been at TCU for what, 34 years now. Uh, and then I just recently started doing macro. And something that's in the back of my head is that I want to look more at the things that like Fidel Kaboob talks about with um, smaller countries and how can they how they can manage this. It's certainly much easier if you're if you're practically self-sufficient. There's no no two ways about that. So it's much easier, which is why, you know, my attitude has always been that, well, maybe it would be harder in Mexico and Colombia, in Zimbabwe. But for crying out loud, let's at least do it here. Uh, let's at least at least like this, a beacon of a civilized economy uh, and a place that can be an anchor for the rest of the world. But the, that was the long answer. The short answer is yes. Yes. Joe has a question. You can unmute yourself now. Or I will ask the question for Joe. Uh, why is it there a focus on government's jobs to ensure the private sector a surplus by spending there? If the government can create and spend its own money, why does capital gain and the public suffer? On the basis of the theory or, the, or law about the ability of the government to create money, why isn't a good social program a better outcome? Yes, I saw this question too uh, as I was go going in and out. Uh, so let's see. And, and I wasn't quite sure if I, if I completely understood it. Um, oh, hey, Stephen, I, I hope you're feeling better. Um, let's see here. Uh, if the government can spend it, then why does... So I, I, I think what it's asking is, um, why are we worried about the... If, I, if I'm... Uh, and please, Joe, if you're out there, correct me here. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the question is, why are we worried about the government having a deficit so the private sector can have a surplus? Why don't the government just do what the government needs to do in terms of social benefit rather than worry about um, you know, the, the private sector getting the, the influx of funds to create profits? And, and that is essentially exactly what we want to do. We want to create good social programs. However, the side effect is going to be whether we intend to or not, they're going to go to Walmart and they're going to spend that money. So it, it's not the intent of a job program to create profits for the private sector, but it will, it will. And honestly, some of this stuff I view, you've got to be strategic about how you sell this to people. So I just gave a talk, was it yesterday? To a local civic group uh, that was mostly business people. And I talked about the debt and the deficit and I sold it the way they would want to hear it. Uh, you know, it's going to create profits for people, which it will. Uh, and I just got an email from the guy that, that set the whole thing up uh, this afternoon saying how much everyone commented on the talk and stuff like that. So, so you may hear uh, MMT post Keynesian types talk about the deficit creating profits for the private sector, but that's not the goal. You're absolutely right. That's not the goal. Who cares? Let, let's do the social programs, but then that will, as a side effect, create the profits. If, if that wasn't the question. Joe here. Joe, yeah. is, that, is that what you wanted to ask? Well, well, well. Yes, um, that was the, the 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 purpose of the question was why should we have a government deficit, you know? And and as it was and as it was stated in the book, you know, with, with the purpose of creating a surplus for the private sector, and 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 it would be different if it was just a matter of 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 the economics of it, but. To say we should have a, have a deficit to do it, it's good to have a deficit to do it. it. Means to me, we have to borrow money from the private sector in order to pay for the private sector to have its surplus. So uh, it just it just doesn't seem it just doesn't seem like the best monetary policy. Right. I, I think the disconnect there is Joe is that we don't have to borrow the money. That the um, federal government makes money with these things right here, these keyboards. Uh, they don't have to borrow it. They simply type it into existence. You know, I would just just use this example with the with the Rotary Club just yesterday, the Arlington Rotary Club. That um, where do you where do people think we borrowed the two trillion dollars this summer? Do they think we borrowed that from China, uh, who were you know looking at one of the worst uh, years of, of economic growth in maybe fifty years? Did they think we borrowed it from Europe, where in, at that time infection rates were worse in Europe than they were here in the U.S. 
Do they think we borrowed it from the private sector in the U.S.? Well, if they had $2 trillion sitting around, we didn't need to have you know, the, the, the CARES Act. So we typed it into existence, uh, as we do all the time. Um, so we don't have to do that, Joe. Uh, and that's why uh, it has to be a deficit. And why also, however, if the government does spend in deficit, then by definition, the private sector is going to have a surplus and some of that surplus is going to be profit. And the dog is actually biting me right now. Uh, but anyway, it's OK. I will survive. Um, Ido has a question. Ido, are you here? I'm going to ask. Oh, Ido is here. You can unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Hi, good evening. Um, so as an exchange rate professor, um, a general question that kind of like I couldn't find uh, in, in, in Stephanie's book, uh, if you could tell us a little bit uh, how exchange rates work. I'm from Israel, so I'm, again, the international perspective oh. is, uh, yeah, because right. just... As an anecdote, now the central bank in Israel is manipulating the, or not manipulating, or purchasing uh, shekels and, and the dollars to, to, to help exporters. So, um, right, right. So, so you want sort of a, a general explanation of how currency prices work in the first place? Right. Oh, yeah, well, very good. Yeah, because she, she alludes to it at the end of that chapter, but she doesn't come out and talk about it. Um, and uh, the... the and I don't know if you all are familiar with neoclassical economics. It's like the mainstream economics. It's the one that's, that's really, really, really wrong and in charge of everything. Uh, and their view of exchange rates is, I'm going to start with, with that. Um, their view of exchange rates is that the primary demand for currency arises when somebody wants to buy a foreign good or service. All right. That that's, you know, that that's the dominant force. Now, think about that. If the U.S. has a trade deficit with Ireland, which they do. Um, then that, well, let's not use Ireland because they, 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 they are stuck with the euro. Uh, if the U.S. has a trade deficit with Japan, which they do, um, then that means that the Japanese are buying far fewer dollars to buy American goods and services than Americans are buying yen for Japanese goods and services. Well, if that's the primary source of demand, then we should expect the dollar to depreciate relative to the yen, hence getting rid of the trade deficit. But that doesn't happen in the real world. In the real world, trade deficits remain for years, decades. And it's because that particular theory is ignoring 90% of the market and that other 90% are financial capital flows. What's really driving the exchange rate is looking to see what, what kind of rate of return can I get on financial assets in the United States? What kind of rate of return can I get on financial assets in Japan? This has a far greater correlation with exchange rate movements by their own admission. The neoclassicals who use this other view that I just explained to you say that, well, you know, you, it, it, you got to look at the really long run, by which they don't mean months or, you know, uh, even years. They mean decades for that to actually work. And even then, it doesn't usually work. Uh, so the primary factor driving exchange rates is going to be capital flows, which is why at the end of the chapter, she is arguing that we must have international capital controls. And this comes almost straight from, from Keynes uh, in, uh, when he was set, trying to set up the Bretton Woods system, not simply as a temporary measure, but forever. We don't want people buying Colombian financial assets to make a quick buck, and then they can get the heck out a week later. Uh, gosh, uh, how much did the peso fall in like two weeks? Uh, 40%, something like that, during the Mexican financial crisis? Now, that wasn't because Americans suddenly bought 40% fewer Mexican goods and services, which is the only way you could explain it with the neoclassical theory. They dumped all their Mexican financial assets. And it was a disaster because many Mexican firms had borrowed money in dollars. So suddenly they owed 40% more than they had initially uh, only because the peso had collapsed. Uh, and so anyway, the, the, the long and the short of that, without giving you my entire 15 week course, is that it is financial capital flows that really drive uh, exchange rate movements. Um, I think a lot of people in the chat are curious about bonds and why countries buy bonds. Can oh. you go over that really quick? Yes, and, and why does the US still sell them? Because uh, 
Once again, the North Arlington Rotary Club comes up uh, because I just talked about this yesterday because I was trying to build it piece for piece, uh, piece by piece for them. Because, you know, the stuff that's in this book, um, th that's in this book. And, and as I, I opened my talk yesterday with, with this, I said, I'm going to tell you stuff where your brain's going to say that makes sense, but your gut's going to say, but they can't possibly be true. Um, and it just takes a while to sit there and think, well, how could it work that way? What was my original position based on and so forth? And so I was explaining to them how, um, as I did a moment ago, the U.S. can create money on this keyboard right here. Uh, so why do we sell bonds at all? Why, why do we sell treasury bills at all? And there's a couple of reasons. One is they're required to, all right? They, 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 they are supposed to do so because as, as, a, as a constraint on uh, federal government spending that, oh yeah, okay, you can do that, but you got to sell these bonds. But it's actually not that hard to do because then the Fed just buys them back. And that's another issue. So if when the federal government spends in deficit, using one of these, if they instantly credit accounts at private banks, which is what they do, all of a sudden there's lots more money out there than there was before this deficit spending, which is going to tend to drive down interest rates. And, and my students do so great at this. Uh, I was like, okay, so, and, and what does the central bank target? And, and there might be a little humming and hawing, but eventually we get around to interest rates. So like, that's right. They target interest rates. Now, so if all of a sudden there's a bunch more money in those bank vaults than there was before, what are interest rates going to do? They're going to go down. So what does the Fed have to do? They're going to drain the money back out. And how do they drain the money back out? With treasury bills. Uh, so, but economically, we don't need to at all. In fact, there's that wonderful piece by Beardsley Rummel, with, with a, with also with a great name, um, taxes are obsolete for revenue or something like that. He published in, I think, 46 or 47, he was involved with the war economy. And, and he published a piece after the war saying, you know what, actually, we don't need to tax uh, for revenue. The federal government can just print it into existence, which is exactly what they did um, in World War II. Uh, that, and I, I have a whole cowboy economist piece on that, by the way, if you want to see that, on how the U.S. financed World War II. And it wasn't how Ken Burns said on his TV special. But I'm, again, I'm going to cut myself off because I can talk and talk. Um, I hope everybody understands that now. Uh, the government does not need to issue or sell bonds. Um, Bakari, hi. You have a question. You can unmute. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Thank you so much. Um, John, you may have already asked, answered this question or something, but um, to me, wouldn't it be better if the government nationalized vital sectors of the economy, such as green, uh, green economy, public housing, public transportation, food, uh, rather than having the private sector control all that. I mean, it seems like, you know, the private sector is kind of, we, we kind of go put everything on them rather than the government being able to do that. Right, right. No. And, and of course, we're seeing just the opposite happen in the UK, uh, where we've got the national health and we have the railroads and so forth that we're all government run. Um, but, you know, gosh, the market's so much more efficient, right? So they're selling off these assets. Uh, and and I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and, and what I, I try to explain to, I guess, students and civic groups and my wife, um, although she's very much a supporter, so don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> but that the private sector does things that are profitable, but not necessarily of social benefit. Some of it is, which is great. You know, uh, restaurants are profitable uh, and they are socially beneficial. The public sector should do things that are socially beneficial, but aren't profitable. And so, for example, having a really efficient bus service or train service or whatever, I don't give a crap whether it's profitable or not. We've got global warming to face. And so we can afford to sink resources. In fact, we can't afford not to. Um, but and of course, uh, uh, national health uh, as well. But yes, absolutely. All those sectors, where we would say, you know what, actually, how much the market would create of that particular good or service, which sometimes is none, uh, is well below what would be socially optimal. So what we need to do is to have the government in charge of that particular aspect. Now, does the government do everything perfectly? No, but David, they're just the private sector. People seem to forget that. They seem to be, well, you know, they, they have this assumption that the private sector is going to do everything efficiently, except that 
you have to understand what their definition of efficient is, which I, I won't go into right now unless you want me to, but, but I've, a couple of my mainstream neoclassical colleagues, I've explained to them what their word efficiency really means. They're like, oh yeah, I guess that's right. Because we think, we, we think um, engineering efficiency, that's not what they mean. So yes, I, there's a long way of saying, I agree with you. So uh, your definition of efficiency, I'm guessing is, uh, the greatest amount of results with the least amount of money put into it. So you're cutting on costs. Or at least uh, resources. Um, but see, th this is the neoclassical definition of, of efficiency, although you have to dig in to get it. The mentioned definition is that the market reacts very quickly to changes in consumer um, tastes or desires. And so as I explained to my colleagues, so what, what it's saying is basically then, if the market is racist, or if I'm sorry, if the people are racist, then the market is inefficient unless it's racist. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Because that, that's all they mean is the transfer from social values to prices. That's all they're talking about when they say the word efficiency. But of course, the word efficiency is loaded. And it sounds like, oh, good. Uh, you know, efficiency is a good thing. Well, it depends on what we're talking about. Indeed. Um, so Steve has a question. Um, I think I'm asking this question for Steve. How do fluctuating currency exchange rates impact Zepter nations who carry high levels of foreign debt? Ooh. Uh, oh, hello, Stephen. Um, that really sucks for them. <laughs> uh, that, uh, yeah, Stephen's question is, you know, if, if I'm Mexico, and I'm carrying lots of debt in dollars and the peso dollar exchange rate is fluctuating, then obviously it depends on which direction. Uh, but, you know, uh, yes, I mean, that, that, that makes them very vulnerable. I, I mean, this is a common story and, I, and I'm preaching to the choir, but the more vulnerable you are, the more screwed you are because the more the system is set against you. And so these countries that, that, that end up owing, owing lots of money in the dollar, um, uh, I'm sorry, Lots of, of, of money are in currencies other than their own. Yeah, very, very much. Well, hell, Greece for that matter. Um, but uh, very much so, Stephen. Um, it, it's, a, uh, it's a problem that, again, Stephanie is trying to get to at the end of that chapter there. But the book's about something else. So I, I noticed somebody criticized her about something or other. You didn't include so-and-so. Okay, well, my attitude always is when somebody says that, I'm looking forward to your book where you include that. Um, but that wasn't her goal. You can only say so many things in one book. So she couldn't get into that, but, but she very much was, was touching on it at the end of that last chapter. So what happens to those other countries? Uh, you mean uh, right now or with a uh, job guarantee? or With a well, job well, guarantee. That doesn't help them much uh, by itself. I mean, if the U.S. had a job guarantee. Uh, yes. And Mexico does not. Correct. Then... Honestly, in some ways, it would hurt them because the dollar would likely be stronger. Uh, so, you know, again, she's, she's suggesting at the end of that chapter, but very quickly, because it's not really her goal to talk about this. There's a lot more to do in terms of helping the developing world. And the developing world, um, I, I, again, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, what, what European colonization did didn't go away. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, I mean, in some ways... The job guarantee in the U.S. you would hope would actually be a positive and a strong dollar, but if so, if I owe money in dollars, then I'm kind of screwed. So we need other reforms at the same time. Got it. Or they could also follow our lead and have their own job guarantee. Yes, yes, that's right. Again, I, I want us to be a beacon. It, when President Bernie Sanders uh, steps in, then we can take care of all this. My wife and daughters, my daughters especially, were so sad. Um, we were talking about this on January 20th. Actually, it was my 60th birthday, by the way. It could have been a much worse birthday. Um, but we were, you know, sharing notes back and forth. Uh, my daughters, I have twins uh, and, and with my wife. And um, I said, you know, I can't help but think about what could have been. And they were like, yeah, yeah. So, but I'll stop talking about it because we should at least be happy today. So, anyway. <laughs> Yes, I, I when he dropped out, I, I bawled. I bawled like I've like I've never like like somebody close to me. I I lost. Yes. It was 
because there was a chance this time. Yeah, there was a chance this time. And I tried not to get too excited, but you you couldn't help it because anyway, uh, sorry, sorry. didn't mean to <laughs> okay. I, I know because we, 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 we all worked really hard for that campaign. So yeah. um, Ralph has a question. Can you hear me? Yes, Perfectly. we can. Okay. What's the implication of euros and China's currency being used to purchase oil from other countries as opposed to their using dollars? Say the very first part again, Ralph. Okay. I just saw something recently that China was purchasing oil from Russia using the yuan or whatever it is. Right, right. Or, or, and I also saw some reference to the fact that euros were being used, you know, to purchase uh, oil from Russia. And what's the implication of that with respect to the U.S. dollar being? (laughs) Right, right. Uh, You know, it's funny you should mention that. and I don't know if everybody heard Ralph's question was, uh, what's the implication of, say, for example, uh, countries using something other than the dollar to buy oil? Or in other words, uh, to put it more generally, the dollar becoming less widely accepted as, as the coin of the realm around the world. And it certainly makes life more difficult for us uh, that right now people accept little pieces of paper in exchange for things like, you know, cell phones. Uh, but um, for years, I said, yeah, but what are you going to replace it with? Uh, the yuan? Are you really going to hold your savings as an international corporation or whatever? Certainly China could do this, uh, and, and they're, they're bigger than they were before, so they have more weight. But are you really going to hold your savings in the currency of a, of a dictatorship? And then the euro appeared to be a, a possible competitor for a while, but then the Greek crisis and, and, and so forth made that less likely. And so it looked like the dollar was, you know, you're absolutely right. The implication is that it then becomes, uh, we become more like one of those developing nations where we need somebody else's currency. Uh, I, I think as long as we're as, as big as we are, it's not going to be a terrible problem for us, but it does make it more like that. Um, so, so you're right about that. But I think so far, things have looked pretty safe until January 6th. And on January 6th, I got to thinking to myself, we are the least stable democracy of the developed world. And now I would start thinking, maybe I don't want to hold dollars after all. Uh, So who knows what's going to happen in the future. But to me, that was the most shocking event in terms of, 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 you know, thinking about a, uh, yeah, that's true. We're not much of a democracy, but but let's put that in quotation marks then. but yes, it would be more difficult. It's, it's hard to imagine that the dollar would become um, like the peso, for example, very difficult to buy foreign goods and services with it. But as it's, um, you pointed out oil, uh, well, gosh, during periods of, of big fluctuations in oil, uh, we had to change in the, in the dollar price, of course, but we didn't also have to worry about Oh my gosh, what if my currency depreciates relative to the dollar? Now oil is even more expensive. So it, it makes life more difficult, no, no doubt. Absolutely. Um, John has a question. Um, I'm going to ask John's question for him. Yeah. Uh, what is to prevent the job guarantee from drawing more and more workers out of the private sector and into government creating sector at each recession point? If that happens, it might start to impact our production of vital products. That's a very good question. Um, and I finally got a chance. What, is it laying down here? I finally got a chance to finish Pavlina's book. Um, no, it's not. It's upstairs. Uh, but uh, Pavlina's book on uh, the case for the job guarantee. And what she argues in there is that we want to set the wage in the public sector low enough to where when the private sector expands, it's attractive to move. And not only is it attractive to move, but now you've got uh, the experience and the training and and not the long period of unemployment that you would have had without the job program. And she also said, and and this was a surprise to me, uh, or actually, I guess I'd seen her say this, but then I had taught myself out of it, but then I read it again and said, well, actually, maybe that does make sense. She wanted a flat rate. It doesn't matter whether you're digging a ditch 
or doing software for the Smithsonian uh, as the job guarantee. She wanted the same rate. She didn't want them to compete with the private sector. So that is the argument, John. Um, whether or not that would hold up, obviously, is you know the devil's in the details. Uh, but um, presumably, if these are fi- if these are vital, um, uh, you know, resource or, not, not, or, or products that we're producing, they would pay relatively well. Um, but that's the idea. The idea is to set the wage such that when the expansion occurs, people are attracted back to the private sector. That's all I can tell you. Got it. Um, so Cole has a question. Um, who benefits by making lies about borrowing U.S. dollars and the national debt? Please answer. Yeah. Hmm. I don't think they're lying. I think they think that. And I got to tell you, but before, you know, while y'all were reading through the book, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do a revise and resubmit on a paper I had sent to the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. And uh, so I, I was looking up things to, okay, so, so, so my statistical model works really well for every period except for the 1990s. So I'm looking up all this stuff about the 1990s to try to figure out, you know, um, okay, well, why doesn't it work? What, what, was, what was significantly different during that period that might suggest why it worked differently? It was so depressing. I kept coming across articles about, uh, and during the 1990s, the government surplus allowed them to spend that money on infrastructure. Uh, and uh, during the 1990s, the government surplus meant that the government was no longer draining money away from the private sector. I think they truly believe it. I don't think it is a lie. Um, I saw an interview with Jamie Galbraith uh, at uh, University of, of, of Texas. Um, and he was being, you know, all these same issues. And the interviewer said, how many people in Congress do you really think understand what you just said? And he kind of sat back for a minute. He's like, like, really understand it? Two, uh, but they honestly believe it, which in some ways is more terrifying than lying. Now, we do have the um, Republicans who, when there's a war to finance, there's plenty of money. And, you know, when there's coronavirus to bail out, there's not. Uh, that seems to be somewhat selective. And, and you've had quotes from people like Cheney and, and Reagan saying the deficits don't matter, but economists don't understand it. Are you aware, you all, of the article by Paul Romer, who's a mainstream economist? This came out, gosh, 2016, something like that, on the trouble with macroeconomics. And this is all macro stuff, of course. And he said macroeconomics in mainstream economics, and he is a mainstream economist, and he won the Nobel Prize not long after that. He said it's been going backwards for 30 years, and it no longer qualifies as scientific research. Um, and he said, and I happened to be on a panel with him uh, b- before he got the Nobel Prize. I kind of like to feel like I pushed him over the top. Uh, but he, he was telling me about the article and he said he caught hell for it. Not because people disagreed, but because how dare you say that? How dare you raise questions about Milton Friedman, about Bob Lucas and so forth? So I think they believe it. And I don't know if that's better or worse. Oh, and I'll t- let me say something else about Galbraith. So he has a wonderful conference that, that's free, by the way, every two years uh, at the University of Texas. And at the end, we all go and eat barbecue or something like that and drink beer. So it's really fun. So we're at that point of the conference. And, and I said to, to, to Jamie, um, what do you think the chances are that we can rescue the economics discipline? He said, oh, none. None. They're gone. So, so what are we going to do? And he said, what we're doing right here. And they had invited policymakers, uh, grassroots leaders, that sort of thing. People like you. They had invited those people, not, not economists because they're lost. So that was a long answer, but there was a lot to say about that. Didn't they notice that every time they, uh, they got rid of the deficit, we would you know, fall into a decline and into a depression? Like, didn't, didn't they, they realize that pattern? Well, you know, I was just thinking about that today. 
there's actually an issue there that I don't think a lot of the MMT people, I don't, I don't mean the scholars, they, they, they know, but, but the people who have been reading it realize. Okay, at the end of the 1990s, we ended up with a surplus, right? But there's a difference between automatic changes in spending and choices, discretionary spending. Whenever the economy is in expansion, tax revenues go up and government spending for things like social programs goes down. So the, 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 the economy or, or the budget starts to close anyway. The, bu- the deficit starts to close anyway, all right? Uh, so, and then John Harvey would argue along with that John Maynard Keynes guy that in the private sector, investment ultimately fizzles out and turns back the other way. Well, it's gonna turn out and fizzle out right when the deficit is the smallest or the surplus is the biggest. So, so, so part of that I think is correlation. But absolutely, without question, the times we have decided as a discretionary choice, let's cut the deficit, it has been disastrous. Um, and in fact, I talked about that, where? In the North Arlington Rotary Club. Um, that, uh, what was it, 1937 to 38? We're finally getting unemployment down from 25% in the US down to 14. And then they decided, well, we're spending too much money. We better try to balance the budget. 19% unemployment. It took them three more years to get it back down. So absolutely, uh, when they make the choice to do that, it, it's not that hard to figure out, is it? I mean, you know, if the, if the government is taxing away more than it's putting back in, or it, then the private sector has less money. <laughs> they, they, they bill themselves uh, as, the mo- as the friendliest club in Arlington. So I don't know. Maybe you should join. <laughs> I will check them out. Roseanne has a question. You can unmute. Hi, John. Howdy. Happy happy belated birthday. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I wanted to just mention I used to be a Rotarian until I until it got kind of expensive. Okay. And maybe I got a little smarter. But be that as it may. How do your students take to the ideas that Stephanie presents in her book? You know, d- don't worry about the economy. Worry about how we're going to take care of people. Right. How do you, because they're the only hope, John. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, and, and I actually am somewhat uh, encouraged by who they are right now. Now, maybe my circle is too small and I don't know that there's a bunch of idiots out there or, 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 or evil kids or whatever. Um, but my experience has been very positive. Um, I, I will say this, though, first, when I, I teach intermediate macro, I'm doing it right now. We're about to have exam one next week. And that's where I would cover all this. But we spend two thirds of the course just setting up the uh, capitalist system. And so by the time we're done with that, um, and, and I, I, I try very hard not, not to, you know, I try, I, I'm going to explain the way it works. You make your choice of which direction you want to go. I, I had a guy in, in my class once, and actually this was a, a nighttime class with, with adults in it. Um, he said he'd been going home and telling his wife what I'd been saying in class. And it was stuff like this. And she said, is he a conservative or a liberal? And he said to her, uh, I don't know. I can't tell. So that works in my favor. All right. So, so I try to establish myself as somebody who it also helps. I, I'm very active in, in, in the inclusiveness um, program on campus. It helps to be a white male. As soon as I walk in the classroom, they assume I know what I'm talking about. And so I try to leverage that privilege in a way that allows me to, to and I, I, I'm going to sound mercenary here, but I don't mean it that way, but, but to gain their trust and to say, look, we're going to explain the way the world really works. And they really appreciate that. Um, and then I finally get to this stuff. And by that point, it seems like logic. Like, well, of course, that's what we should do. So if you spend, if you spend 10 weeks laying out how unstable the capitalist system is, how uh, it doesn't, doesn't guarantee full employment, how in the private sector, labor is a cost, so it's not something they want to maximize, 
by the time you get to the end of the semester, they're like, well, yeah, that makes sense to me. And I would also say on those lines that, that again, my, my circle may be too small, but my daughters are, uh, we have twins. They're 26. They'll be 27 in June. Man, their circle of friends are sick and tired of capitalism. And or at least the form that we have right now. Uh, and I know that a, a colleague of mine in political science, his daughter said, we need you to hurry up and die talking to her dad saying, and not that he's a bad person, your generation we need to get rid of you so we can make these changes. So even though TCU is a, a relatively, it's a relatively reasonable private school, but it's still a private school, I mean, a vast majority white. Um, I find that our students are very open to these ideas. So that's a good thing. Uh, John, I'm going to apologize. We've gone an hour and a half without mentioning the cowboy economist. Would you <laughs> please tell our guests what the cowboy economist is? Well, I had, okay. So first of all, um, if I hadn't done this, I might have wanted to do stand-up comedy. Uh, in fact, I did in high school for our senior talent show. And it, my wife and I were just talking about this because she, she was into singing uh, when she was in high school. So we like performing. I'm very, I'm actually an introvert, but I like performing. Uh, but they had to open the curtains behind me to get me off the stage when I was doing this in high school. So I thought, well, I should do a series of videos explaining how the economy works, but make it kind of funny. And I don't know what made me go get the cowboy hat because I was born in England and I don't like country music. But I do have a cowboy hat from a drunken night that Melanie and I spent out at a cowboy bar. Um, and so I put the cowboy hat on and I started to like, you know, Hattie, I didn't hear you come in. Uh, and so I try to explain all these things. Yes, I have. And you know how many how many yeehaws did Bernie Sanders get? He got five. He got all of them. Although I believe I gave the deficit uh, myth 10. So even though it was out of five. So it's somewhere on YouTube. I think if you search for the cowboy economist, I've got like. 20, 25 videos right now covering various things about, about economics. Um, I haven't done one in a while because, man, this COVID stuff, it has been much more work teaching uh, to, to have it also available online as well. So I've just been worn out. Uh, so I, I really feel bad about that. I'll tell you the next video I want to do is on um, the fact that the economics discipline is one of the most white male disciplines of any in academia. And that, that's above engineering. We're the most male major at my university's campus, above engineering, above finance, above all these other, above, above ranch management. We're above them. And I think I can explain why. It has to do with, you, know, you, should, you should see the neoclassicals struggle with it. Well, is it that there's too much math? Is it that women simply aren't interested in economics? No, it's because your theory sucks. Because when I sit down, in an introductory economics class, as a person of color or a woman, and I hear that capitalism is objective and that you're rewarded commensurate with your contribution, then I'm done with economics. But anyway, that's my next cowboy economist. So, uh, thank you, Virginia. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I, I, I understand that it's, it's just, there's no logic in it. It's just offensive. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alfonso has a question. Um, it's oh, Alfonso is here. No, He's on mute. Or I can ask for you, Alfonso. Yeah, is pricing currencies just triangulating values relative to the U.S. dollar? Is that the question? That is the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, it depends on the currency, actually. I mean, if I'm trading yen and euros, I don't really give a crap about the dollar. Uh, now, certainly in, if we're talking about, well, there are, this is kind of interesting. Okay, well, maybe just to me, uh, that the, their exchange rates are floating and exchange rates are fixed, right? So some currencies are fixed together uh, and some currencies are allowed to float against each other. And when they're fixed, the government's intervene to try to hold them there. Uh, there are more fixed currencies in the world than there are flexible, 
but far more trade takes place at flexible rates than fixed rates. Because what you end up happening with is you know, Venezuela fixes itself to the dollar or, or, or uses the dollar. And um, so in those cases, certainly that would be the case. But again, I go back to the wonderful thing about my job is I can only I can focus on um, uh, what uh, I, I'm most interested in. And I've always done developing country exchange rates. Uh, the dollar Deutsche Mark, which apparently doesn't exist anymore, someone told me the other day. Uh, the dollar euro, the dollar yen, and that sort of thing. And I only recently added in uh, the the developing country stuff in my class, which I should have done a long time ago. But and, and yes, Stephen, I could, but I'm too busy making T72s and T80s and T90s. I have a 3D printer. Uh, I, I love uh, military history. Um, and if you look over here, I don't know if you can see or not. I actually have a battle set up right over there uh, with miniatures. Uh, I wrote my own rules for this game. But um, Stephen was asking if I could also make Warhammer uh, figures of that. I could, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm sticking with Lord of the Rings and, and uh, World War III. <laughs> I'm glad you answered that question. Yes, yeah, People really yes, wanted you to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Dan has a question. Please unmute. Hi. Uh, Hi just wanted to, uh, to, to, to thanks for, for coming on and also uh, ask about covering primary ed costs. That seems like the, the discussion around uh, cover, covering secondary ed costs goes back and forth on socialism, but everybody accepts that we cover primary ed costs. So if the Fed stepped up and covered those, it seems like it would address a lot of inequalities that are tied to property taxes and also free up a lot of uh, fiscal space for municipalities and states. Yeah. And what's wrong with people that they don't see that? What's wrong with people like Betsy DeVos? Right. They're actively fighting against it. You know, Melanie teaches fourth grade. And I got to tell you, I don't know about you guys, but we've been drinking too much since COVID. All right. Uh, and so I've heard that from a lot of people. Uh, and so, and right you might have there, there, there literally is vodka in this right now. All right. So, um, so we said, you know, we're not going to drink all week though. All right. Well, Melanie brought home a bottle of wine because you know what happened today at her grade school? Five people are out with COVID. And you know what the state of Texas is covering? Uh, those teachers. What the state of Texas is covering for you if you have to go out because of COVID? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It, it, you're just going to lose money. Uh, now, fortunately, her school district, which is a very small school district south of Fort Worth, Everman, they said, no, we're going to chip in some money if you have to leave, you know, for quarantine or whatever. But she had to have a test before. she. I said, I, I don't know what to do. You've had five people. And I'm around her a lot, as it turns out. Um, so she got a test before she came home. She, she was negative. But uh, she said, but I, I got to get a bottle of wine. I know we said no drinking till the weekend. We, Saturday night is karaoke night. Um, so then you have to have to drink. Um, but, uh, and, and, and yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I can't even begin. To, I don't know where to start. And, and I should bring Melanie down here, but she drank almost that whole bottle of wine by herself. Um, so she has led several uh, Save Texas Schools um, marches and so forth. Uh, the right apparently wants to destroy public education. I can think of some really evil reasons for it, but I can't think of any logical reasons for it. And so absolutely, we should be funding the, the poorest school districts from federal money because uh, the, the stronger these people are and get rid of the damn tests, all right? Or at least put so much weight on it. Uh, so I, I don't know, I don't have, I'm sorry, I've talked for so long about something where I simply could have said, yes, absolutely, but, but it's such a, terrible problem. Um, they had here in Texas, when we, when we first moved here in like 87, um, I think in 1990 or 91 or so, they passed something called the Robin Hood Law, where they took money from rich school districts and gave it to poor school districts. Well, it was outrage, of course. Do you know what they put in in Melanie's school district, which is, which is primarily uh, lower income? They, here, here's the extravagance they got at her school district. They put carpet down in the library. Because before it was just, um, uh, 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 you, know, you know, tile and it was noisy in the library. So it made such a difference. 
So, geez, I'm sorry you lost your chess club. Um, but anyway, uh, very passionate about that. I, I agree absolutely. Yeah, it, it, but he was. Oh, sorry. But he was asking, could Biden instruct the Fed to do it? I mean, legally, we all agree that they should. Oh, that's a political science question. I don't actually know. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean. Gosh, apparently Trump could do almost anything he wanted, so surely to God. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know legally what is permitted. Um, no, I, I, I don't. I don't know how that works. Uh, I do know we need to get rid of the Senate, um, but uh, that, that's that's not going to happen. Uh, but um, I'm I'm assuming that it would have to become legislation and pass through Congress. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if it can be in an, an executive order. Right. And from 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 speaking with others, I, I understand it, it, it's like a, a racist policy that's done on purpose so that uh, wealthy people get the best education and people right. who aren't wealthy don't. Right. And I, I really hate it. I think it's unfair yeah, because... Yeah. Because I have to purposely, you know, move. Pla- I have two young children. I have to purposely move places that are practically unaffordable as far as the taxes are, oh, just yeah. so my kids can get a proper education. Right, right, right. No, it, it's. I mean, I, I hope we're not seeing the end of of, of liberal liberal democracy in, in our world, but we know how it's all looking, and I don't mean just the U.S. I mean all over the place. Hey, I'll be dead though. So I got what, 30 more years? So spend my time making stuff on my 3D printer. I'm right behind you and I'm making yes. stuff on and my I have Irish citizenship. Too. So I've been thinking, well, we retire to Ireland near a pub and we wait out the end of the world. So <laughs> invite me. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. Uh Raul has a question. <laughs> Raul, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, here I am. Yeah, I got a, a second, a second question in tonight. Uh, I just, I probably, I, w- I would have maybe picked this first, but it just came back. Uh, what are the main implications of BRIC countries? So I'm talking Brazil, Rus- Russia, India, China, as well as Iran and others trading amongst themselves without using the U.S. dollar. And I'm sorry, Rahul, because of my stupid dog, I missed the very beginning, but I caught all the, the rest of the stuff about, uh, you know, local groups trading with, together without using the dollar. Exactly. Yeah. What is the impact of that? Let's say the main implications from a U.S. standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my, my first gut instinct is screw the U.S. Um, that's a real damn shame that somebody's going to be able to, to carry out trade without involving you. But yeah, it's along the same lines as as someone asked earlier about the U.S. not being the, the sort of, of, of central currency. It makes it more difficult uh, for the U.S. to simply exchange pieces of paper for things like oil uh, and cell phones. Um, but gosh, what a better world it would be. And, and oh, if you haven't read stuff by Eileen Grable, um, Eileen, I-L-E-N-E, uh, Grable, G-R-A-B-E-L, she's a, a, a post-Keynesian who does lots of stuff on developing countries. She's at, at uh, University of Denver. And she wrote a really interesting piece. It's like every time I read something of hers, uh, I learn something, co- I, like it, I have to stop and think about it. It's like, I haven't thought about that. She was talking about after the last financial crisis, a lot of developing countries decided, screw the IMF, they're no help. Screw the World Bank. We're gonna create local uh, sort of, of international organizations to look after our interests, to uh, trade with our currencies, just as you're suggesting, to build up stockpiles of foreign currency in case something bad happens. And she was describing this as a much better solution, that they were much more in tune with their own local problems. They were much more in tune with helping themselves and not helping you know, the, the, the developed nations. Uh, so in the long run, I, I, again, my, my um, initial uh, Reaction is uh, that, gosh, that would be wonderful for the world, uh, and it wouldn't be as great for the U.S. 
but through the U.S. You can find more of these recordings at realprogressives.org. There is one for each chapter. Go to the media menu and look for the RP Book Club. While you're there, be sure to check out the Macro and Cheese podcast and a wide range of other materials on MMT and other progressive issues. Thanks for joining us.